depending on the situation, being called an animal could be a good or a bad thing. You're an animal in the gym, or don't eat like an animal. Either way, you can decide for yourself which one is the good one and which one is the bad one. Using terms like animal or beast to describe human behavior has been something that has made author Jeffrey Mason wonder why people could be so far off. He explains why in his new book, Beasts, What Animals Can Teach Us About the Origins of Good and Evil. Jeffrey, welcome to Take Two. Pleasure to be here, eh? All right, so exactly how far off would you say that characterization is? Well, the example you gave in the beginning is is mild. He's an animal. That's fine, you know, describing somebody who's strong and, yeah. and, and does certain things. But we tend to use it in a very pejorative way, especially beasts. So you can hardly open a newspaper without having some human described as a beast, and they don't mean it in a good sense. And just think of everything. He's a pig. He's a dog. Uh, we just have, you know, he's a worm. He's a rat. He's a... Chicken. I mean, we just almost every word that describes an animal is used pejoratively by humans. And I think we've made a terrible mistake because the animals that we're describing when we want to say something nasty, especially about human violence, we tend to look to animals and we have it backwards because the animal world contains far less violence than the human world. Look. What are there? Between four and 5,000 mammals. Can you guess what percentage are actually carnivores, eat other animals? It's only 10%. The other 90% are, are complete vegetarians. In fact, I shouldn't even call them vegetarians. They're vegans. They eat only plants. And what we consider the animals, when we think about it, the animals that we like to look at and think about are called charismatic megafauna. And that includes elephants and giraffes and gorillas and many hippo hippos the animals that we love to see on youtube and that we love to read about are all vegetarian species and almost totally nonviolent. elephants almost never kill one another and certainly don't attack other animals unless they're protecting their young and that's true of all of these animals so we've really got it backwards what for years, we've tried to study human violence by looking at animal violence. We have to study human violence by looking at the absence of animal violence. Well, it's interesting that you should say predatory nature. I'm not sure that that is part of our nature. Consider the fact, contrary to what President Obama said during his... Uh, speech when he got the Nobel Prize for peace, he said war began with the first man. That's absolutely false. It did not. War is something, as the great researcher on early war, Brian Ferguson from Rutgers points out, it's something you have to learn. It's not something you're born with. We are not born with an instinct to go to war or even a predatory instinct, as you called it. This is something we get from our, our upbringing, that we get from the culture around us, and it's unfortunate. But it also, the good part is, if we learned it, we can unlearn it, <laughs> and we can simply refuse to go along with it. We don't have to go to a war college to learn to kill other human beings. We can say, no, thank you. That's one of my uh, main, that's exhibit A in my book, because orcas in the wild have never killed a human being, ever. And here's, here's the more astonishing thing. In the wild, no orca has ever killed another orca. It's never been seen. No orca researcher can point to a single instance where an orca killed another orca. So, and, and that... Um, that documentary you mentioned, which was wonderful, Blackfish, it's just an amazing documentary, one of my favorite of all time, point out that Tilikum was, of course, in a completely artificial situation. No animal of any kind, let alone an animal that roams 50 miles a day, should be kept in a pool. It's absurd. Uh, it's a crime against nature. So Tilikum became a psychopathic orca because of the trauma that he underwent living in a bathtub. You, you would, if you lived in a bathtub for 20 years, you'd go psychotic too, no telling what a human would do. 
So the only reason he attacked is because he was no longer a real orca. And we are to blame for that. It happens with every animal. It happens with elephants. It happens with dolphins who sometimes attack um, porpoises just because they're living in a toxic environment. And I'm beginning to wonder if it's not true of humans too. If it may not be, now this is a really outlandish thing to say, I realize it, I don't think anyone said it, but I wonder if humans are not violent because we as a species have been traumatized. Well, first of all, the scale. I mean, if you consider the fact that in the 20th century alone, humans have killed more than 200 million other humans. And that we have things like genocide and slavery and torture um, and child abuse. These are things that one does not find in nature. Now, it's true that um, chimpanzees tend to be more violent than just about any other primate. But are we as closely related to chimpanzees as we are, for example, to bonobos? No. Turns out we are slightly more closely genetically related to bonobos who never engage in violence. So I'm not sure that you could say that we have a tendency, an instinct, an inborn predisposition to, to violence any more than chimpanzees do. But even if, they, if we did, what is the lesson we're supposed to take away from that? Why not bonobos? Even if we evolve to do these things, we can choose not to do them. That's the wonderful thing about being a human. We're the only animal that gets to choose what we eat. Every other animal in nature, every animal without exception, eats what every other animal of that species eats. Only humans can say, no, I'm not going to eat that. I choose to eat differently. So in that sense, we are somewhat different, different because we may have evolved to eat meat, or at least we've done so for tens of thousands of years. But though there are many of us today who say, no, I don't want to. I'm not going to. I read an article that I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race. I, I was just startled by the title. It's by Jared Diamond. Everybody knows from Guns, Germs, and Steels and the Third Chimpanzee and the day before yesterday recently, uh, a remarkable writer. And um, he suggested in that article, a very short article, you can find it online anywhere, he said the worst mistake in the history of the human race was agriculture. And I want to refine that. I read it. I was persuaded and many other scholars have written about this, that that once we had agriculture, we got despotism, we got racism, we got greed, which is still very much with us today. We got war, um, we got slavery. All of these things happened only about 10,000 years ago. Now, I want to add to that, that we also started around then domesticating other animals. And when we did that, I think we unleashed something in humans that has remained with us to today and has not been to our benefit because the only reason we domesticated those animals. Now, I'm excluding here dogs and cats because dogs and cats, we didn't domesticate. They domesticated us and they haven't entirely succeeded. We're not as good as dogs. Our nature is not as friendly. Our power of love is not as good as dogs, but they're trying hard and they're still working at it. But if you think of chickens and goats and cows and pigs and sheep and ducks and all these other animals that we domesticated, we did it exclusively in order to exploit them. We wanted their flesh. We wanted their skin. We wanted their children. We wanted their eggs. We wanted their milk. And we didn't care ultimately how much they suffered. And the end result of that is that we have factory farming. And nobody's going to say that factory farming is a good thing for humans or for animals or for the planet, which is why Al Gore has now announced that he's a vegan for the sake of the planet. And, and you know, Bill Clinton did it for the sake of his health, and, and many of us do it for the sake of animals. But the point is that when we started domestication, we began something that's had a snowball, slow traumatizing effect to make us a species that is willing to exploit other species and ourselves, our own species. 
So if you think about it, where did the idea for slavery came, come from? It came from animal domestication. That's the consensus from the scholars who are working on slavery. And my question to them is, well, if it was so wrong to do to another human being, which it is, of course, why is it okay to do to another animal? I say they're wrong. And we are more and more animal signed. I wrote about this a long time ago. I think it was about 18 years ago, When Elephants Weep, The Emotional World of Animals. And then I followed it with um, Dogs Never Lie About Love. And then I, I went on to look at farm animals called The Pig Who Sang to the Moon. Is it possible farm animals have deep emotions? And, you know, that was some time ago, but it's, it's pretty much well accepted now. There are very few people who would deny it. And you, elephants, of course, is our, our favorite example of this because there was the YouTube sensation that was sent to me at least a hundred times of these elephants in the wild when a man who'd been helping them died. They came, I don't know how far, but maybe a hundred miles, and they came in a huge procession to pay their respects to their dead comrade. And I believe it. I mean, I, at first I thought, well, maybe that's not true, but I looked into it a bit more carefully and apparently it is true. They actually did do that. Um, and, and so they knew that a human had died and they knew that this human had helped them and they came to pay their respects. Now in that, in that sense, we're a little bit similar because we also pay our respects to dead elephants. But we don't want to keep them in zoos anymore, any more than elephants want to keep us in captivity in the wild. That's the lesson they're trying to teach us, live and let live.